Good morning. Welcome to the third and final day of the uh, Immigration Recasting the Debate, Voices of Our Times conference here at Wake Forest. It's been a great couple of days and we look forward to another one today. Our panel uh, this morning will be considering the effects of current immigration and deportation policies on immigrant communities and the, con the consequences of failure to reform in this area. Our first speaker will be Patricia Fernandez Kelly. She's a senior lecturer in the Sociology Department and the Office of Population Research at Princeton University. She's the co-editor of the recently published Out of the Shadows, Political Action and the Informal Economy in Latin America, and of NAFTA and Beyond, Alternative Perspectives in the Study of Global Trade and Development. Our second speaker will be Margaret Taylor, who's a professor of law here at Wake Forest University. She teaches courses in immigration law, legislation and administrative law, and torts. Margaret's research focuses on immigration detention policy and the deportation of criminal offenders. Most recently, she's been a contributor to a symposium uh, sponsored by the Stanford Law Review on the topic of immigration courts. And she's testified on immigration detention before Congress and the U.S. Commission on Immigration Reform. After they each speak for about half an hour, we'll have the opportunity for questions and answers in the process that we followed before. So we'll begin. Patricia. Thank you very much. I am very honored to be here, and I'm particularly grateful that uh, you arrived uh, so early in the morning. I think this is a great turnout, and I am delighted. I want to congratulate the organizers. Um, I myself organize quite a few uh, conferences and symposia regularly as part of my activities with the Center for Migration and Development at Princeton University, and uh, I'm pretty sure I wouldn't have never been able to fill a room with 600 seats uh, with such an interesting audience. So my hat goes off to the organizers uh, who've really produced what I think is so far an impeccable event. And I thank you again for being here in order to listen to some uh, elaboration of things that were said yesterday. You'd imagine that after such excellent presentations yesterday, there was not more any, anything else to say, but there is. And uh, there's a lot more. And uh, my hope uh, here is to be as succinct and as clear as I possibly can and to try to make a compelling case uh, for rationalizing immigration policy and stopping uh, the demonization of immigrants, uh, both undocumented uh, and uh, legal. And so I begin uh, with a vignette. I want to organize my presentation around two vignettes. The first one is about Magdalena, a Mexican woman who works at a, a nursing home in Hillsboro, uh, New Jersey. Magdalena called me um, about a week ago, a few days ago, uh, partly because uh, although I'm originally from Mexico City, and I arrived in this beloved country in 1976. I had never felt any interest in joining an immigrant uh, organization, partly because I really didn't feel like an immigrant. I felt like I belonged in this country. After all, I had already been teaching uh, art history for six years before arriving here. And I felt that I had the credentials and the disposition that were consistent with ideas of fair play, individualism, hard work, uh, personal autonomy. And so for a long time, I wrote about immigration, um, thinking that it was a happy subject, uh, a subject very much akin uh, to the values of the nation and the identity of the nation. Unfortunately, starting 2004, <coughs> that ceased to be the case. And I apologize, I have a very bad cold. And so I hope I will be able to get through this. In 2004, living in Princeton, New Jersey, <coughs> we began um, seeing the consequences of um, immigration and custom enforcement uh, raids in the vicinity. <coughs> and soon afterwards, I became part of an organization formed by local activists uh, called the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund. I now chair that organization <coughs> and 
and I see my mandate as an educational mission, as part of an educational mission, and also trying to establish uh, some kinds of connections with people who are incredibly scared and confused, confused at, that, at, at this time. And it is for this reason that Magdalena called me. She wanted me to know a couple of things. First of all, uh, that she worried about the elderly people who are being hosted in that nursing facility, nursing home facility, because she feels that uh, they are really being basically warehoused. And that the workers in the establishment, all of whom are unauthorized immigrants, in that case, interestingly, mostly from Peru and Colombia, she said, I am the only Mexican, are living constantly with death. Uh, the, uh, the older people are neglected, and so it is left uh, to the unauthorized immigrants who work there to take care of their needs and to cater with them, with, uh, to them when they are at the verge of uh, death. It is hard work, she said. I live with death all the time, and the wages, of course, are very, very small. So that's always been part of the discussion of immigration, and that is that immigrants, particularly those who are undocumented, uh, tend to uh, be employed in some of the most unwelcome, harsh, and uh, low-paying jobs. But the second part is more relevant to our discussion this morning, she said, and yesterday, the ICE police came, and they started banging on the doors, and they got in here because they were after uh, one of the employees, uh, a Polish man uh, without documentation. So he ran into the woods and later gave himself up. They had already arrested uh, the couple's uh, children. The woman was actually working, uh, cleaning and washing the clothes of the elderly people, and it was in the, in the laundry that she was apprehended and then taken to a detention center. I want to ask, how did we get there? I mean, how does it become in the national interest to arrest a Polish woman and her husband? If you know the facts, you know that Polish illegal immigration is hardly even a bleep in the radar screen. There is not a Polish immigration problem in the United States. So how did we get there? Well, yesterday I thought uh, the presentations, it, it's a question that I want to answer very quickly, by saying that yesterday the presentations were magnificent. Uh, in my field, one of my fields of expertise is immigration, uh, but yesterday brought me even more knowledge and uh, beautifully uh, delivered presentations. I think one of the things that comes out of yesterday is a clear understanding about the ambivalence of American attitudes toward immigration in general and toward uh, uh, unauthorized immigration in particular. Uh, some of you might were here yesterday when there was a quote shown in the screen behind um, with a quote from Benjamin Franklin, if I remember correctly, from 1751, uh, a quote in which Franklin expresses concern about the dangers of Germanization of the country and the uh, problems of losing identity. Well, I want us to go even farther back because George Washington himself expressed concerns about the loss of national identity as a result of immigration. So we understand that. We understand that as a nation, we have ambivalent and often conflicting emotions toward immigration. But the post 9-11 period has really exacerbated those contradictions. Partly as a result, this is something I really want to share with those of you who are not aware of the timeline that has led uh, to some of these outcomes. The post 9-11 period resulted in the creation of the Department of Homeland Security. But what this meant uh, for immigration policy was of huge, huge magnitude because the in Immigration and Naturalization Service, and I never knew I was actually going to learn to miss it, was actually dismembered uh, with most of it being folded into the Department of Homeland Security and then the Border Patrol um, uh, left alone in order to protect uh, the US-Mexican 
um, um, uh, international uh, demarcation uh, line. What did this, this mean de facto, which people I don't think appreciate sufficiently, is that turning most of immigration policy into the Department of Homeland Security, the facto made immigration a matter of national security. And so all immigrants were thus de facto regarded as potential risks to the integrity of the country and the national security of the nation. But you see, the problem is that there are hardly enough Middle Easterners, not that they don't deserve protection, that's not what I'm saying, and definitely very few, very few potential terrorists, because when there are potential terrorists on this land, we do get to know that. And we are immediately told, because it is in the interest of these organizations, uh, to affirm and justify their mandate. The problem is that there are not those many people that can uh, justify the actions of Homeland Security. Instead, the majority of immigrants in this country that, constitutes, that constitute, quote, a problem are Mexican and increasingly people from Central America, uh, particularly Guatemalan. So I must report with great joy that uh, Homeland Security has indeed been very successful in defending us from Guatemalan terrorism. And that uh, we now uh, do not have to fear uh, all those people camouflaging as landscapers and nannies and toilet cleaners uh, because we are putting them in their place. That is one cluster uh, that I do want to bring to your attention. If you detect uh, irony and anger in my tone, you're quite right, uh, as a matter of fact, because I think that this is not just about upholding American principles of uh, law-abiding citizens. Um, it is a result of wrong thinking. It is a travesty of American institutions. And to say, for example, that the unintended consequences of this misguided policy has been to terrify and terrorize a large number of people whose whole mission in life is basically to come and do uh, work on our behalf so that their children will have some entitlement to the American dream is not a falsity. And so that is the first part of my presentation. The second one has to do with lawbreakers. I listen to radio all the time, partly because I'm a masochist, uh, but also because over the years I thought at listening to the more extreme perspectives is voiced by people like Rush Limbaugh, Sean Hannity, Michael Savage, Mark Levine, and others in the same kind of group, did expose me, having been trained as a, a social anthropologist, expose me not to mainstream America, but certainly to some of the more uh, silent uh, and uh, less obvious uh, dimensions of the American experience. Well, um, as I say, I've been in this country for a very long time, and until fairly recently, uh, the kinds of morality issues that galvanized uh, people on the radio were subjects like, uh, like abortion or gay rights, and people, of course, frothed, uh, frothed at the mouth, uh, figuratively speaking, uh, when discussing those subjects. It's been a, quite a long time since I've heard those two subjects uh, discussed seriously by talk show, uh, uh, talk uh, program hosts. Instead, immigration has become the new abortion. And the, uh, uh, the basic objection that is voiced repeatedly from five o'clock in the morning uh, through 12 o'clock at night, uh, at least, is we are not against immigration, okay? We are a country of immigrants. What we object to are those lawbreakers because there are people standing in line trying to do things just as Americans always do them, which is in total compliance to our legal system. And so all we want is for these people who are stealing the jobs of our own people. Certainly we're really, really in solidarity with African Americans. Uh, the, we express a real concern uh, toward impoverished African Americans because those lawbreakers are taking jobs away from them. Well, you know, silver lining. Suddenly, 
we express solidarity to impoverished African Americans. But it's a disingenuous position to take because when you look at two factors, you begin wondering what the argument is really about. The first one is that the very same people who celebrate the beauty of the market as an instrument for establishing balance between supply and demand and bringing us democracy and fair play are the same people who apparently are in favor of all liberalization of all markets except one, that of the labor market. So that there is a total disconnection between supply and demand. We did have, I don't want to go in that direction because it will take too long, but we did have a golden opportunity in 1992-93 in order to do in our own way something similar to what the European Union did, and that is to say, if we're going to liberalize all markets, if we're going to allow increased investment in the Mexican countryside, if we are willing to establish a bilateral agreement with Mexico, let us factor in workers, because it is stupid, nay, unrealistic, to imagine that if you are actually going to increase production in the Mexican countryside, and introduce machinery which displaces workers, that those workers will not actually come seeking for opportunities in the United States. Well, exactly the point uh, that the European nation confronted with workers, say, from Portugal. I don't remember a huge debate on the subject. It was clear that through bilateral agreements, and in the case of Europe, <coughs> multilateral agreements, it was possible not to transform Spain or Portugal into Norway or Sweden, but to raise the ceiling so that workers would not have a tremendous incentive to go, say, in a mass uh, to Germany or to other places. It's worked pretty well. Of course, in the United States, we know that anything that is French or European is probably wrong. But the facts are that while not perfect, that system certainly uh, is a big, big lesson and works much, much better than our system <coughs> in which we decided not to consider labor issues as part of the NAFTA agreement. So <coughs> if you take that and in addition you take the loss of supply and demand and recognize, as was said yesterday, that the availability of green cards for semi-skilled and unskilled workers is minuscule. Then you understand that we have now a system that does work. It does work in order to guarantee illegality. Not because the workers are responding to the laws of supply and demand, but because we have not adjusted our policies, both our labor policies and our immigration policy to those realities. Do all Mexicans want to come to the United States? No. As a matter of fact, some of you were here yesterday when it was said that about 200 million people throughout the world cross international borders in search of opportunity. That is a minuscule number by comparison to the total number of world inhabitants. I understand that if you're in New York, you wouldn't believe it because it is an area that is a, a point of destination of immigrants. But let's take a little bit of perspective. Less than 2%, and I'm being very conservative here, less than 2% of the world's population ever crosses international borders. And why is that? Because it's very hard. Imagine those of you who have grown up in the United States with all the advantages that this country provides. Imagine what it's like to be impoverished, to have to raise money in order then to have the privilege of risking death in a very horrible way through the Arizona desert, leaving behind your children, your family, everything that is known to you for the privilege of being admitted into a country and then facing hostility. Most people would not do that. And I certainly would have never done that. So we need not fear that all of Mexico is going to end up in our living rooms. It certainly will not uh, happen. We have created a system of assured illegality. And then 
and we turn around and we say, but it's just that they don't respect the laws. We're not against them. They should just not break the laws. Those people who hold that position should be reminded that it is a venerable and wonderful tradition in the United States to break and oppose bad laws. It is part and parcel of our national identity, beginning with the Boston Tea Party and certainly continuing with the abolitionist movement. Are there people here who would tell me that at that time they would have been repeating, re respect the laws, many did, respect the laws that segregate, oppress, and support slavery, even as Sojourner Truth was risking her life in the Underground Railroad. Martin Luther King and the Civil Rights Movement were all based upon the breaking of laws. And why not, ladies and gentlemen, why not? After all, the country stands for more than that, and the law cannot be above, the ju above justice. The law cannot be above morality. So what moderate people like myself are arguing is for an adjustment of the American values to what is at present a broken and ineffectual immigration policy. So I finish with three points. The horror of it all is that it is exactly those who have sought asylum and refuge in this in the United States, like Guatemalans, who have ended up being more likely to receive deportation orders. That's part of the tragedy. Uh, Guatemalans faced a genocidal war for 12 years in their country of origin. And eventually, uh, many came to this country, including Princeton, where I live, seeking asylum. But because they didn't have the numbers or the political clout, their names ended up in a system and they were processed until they eventually ended up with final deportation orders. It means that a very large number of families have been divided. It means, for example, that a family that I knew, the woman was in the Princeton area, a maid for about 15 years. Her daughter, a student in good standing at Ryder University, was about to graduate. It was then in 2004 that the ICE men cometh, the ICE police arrived at four o'clock in the morning, uh, knocking doors rudely, took the mother and the father and an uncle out in shackles and uh, handcuffs, because these are not, as shown in Ugly Betty, normal uh, detainments. You are detained as a criminal. And so the young daughter, who had uh, left uh, her country of origin, Guatemala, as an infant was deported to that country, a country that she cannot remember and a country of which she is not part. In addition, these deportation um, uh, raids, which continue throughout the nation, have had five deleterious effects. The first one is that it's making uh, communities less safe because uh, individuals without documentation uh, become easy prey uh, to the assaults of uh, other uh, criminals. Uh, they know they are paid in cash. They know they will not go to the police in order to denounce crimes. And so it has not been uh, unusual for Guatemalans and Mexicans uh, to be separated from their money after being paid. Second, the same is true about cases of domestic violence with many women now suffering the consequences of alcoholism and tensions that are almost unsurmountable and then being the victims of domestic violence. We've had many cases like that uh, 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 come to uh, our attention as part of the Latin American Legal Defense and Education Fund. Third, the idea that undocumented immigrants are a class of people separate from the rest of the community, very wrong. Many of these unauthorized immigrants are brothers, sisters, fathers, sons, who dwell in communities and families in which other people are green card holders 
or citizens. So that to imagine so-called illegals as a separate breed, a group that threatens American integrity is completely misguided. Uh, fourth, it is not true that uh, illegal aliens, first generation illegal aliens, are uh, represented in large numbers among uh, crime, uh, um, uh, among the criminal class. And this is of particular importance to me. Yesterday, I put forth two points and I want to repeat them today. First, to this day and despite all efforts, it's still the case that legally, it is a violation of civil statute to cross the border without authorization. It is not a criminal offense. And most of the violations that take place in the country once those unauthorized immigrants have crossed the border are also not major crimes, except for those that result, say for example, from driving without a license intoxicated by alcohol and having the terrible misfortune of accidentally uh, running over someone. Something that we could easily avoid by adjusting the immigration uh, policy. But the second part to this is that first generation immigrants are generally not engaging in crime for a very simple reason. Most of them come to this country in order to make a life for their children and they do want to keep a low profile, so they do not engage in crime. It is therefore obscene to have people like uh, Tom Tancredo, now running for uh, um, president, or Congresswoman Virginia Fox, uh, portraying uh, Mexicans as a predominantly criminal uh, class. Uh, they probably do represent this old and uh, notable tradition of Americans uh, that goes from having been an immigrant to not wanting immigrants. Uh, Mr. Tancredo's uh, uh, ancestors were Italians, uh, and Italians about whom John Cabot Lodge, the uh, 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 statesman and uh, historian, uh, said exactly the same things that now Tancredo says about Mexicans, that they are a threat, to our institutions and uh, criminal. But I do want, as I close, simply uh, to say that it's particularly offensive to me to observe and listen uh, to Tancredo uh, represent uh, a, a, a undocumented immigrants uh, as deportables and as criminals. Only recently, he took an opportunity, uh, a, a, a horrendous crime, execution style murder of several students bound for a uh, university in Delaware who were killed at gunpoint. Um, the perpetrator of this horrible crime is a man by the name of Jose Carranza, originally from, uh, uh, from Peru. Carranza came to this country at the age of 12. And you'll see uh, what this means. It means that Tancredo can actually talk about Carranza as an illegal who represents the threats to the integrity of this nation and encourage his fam the families of the murdered children uh, to sue the city of Newark for having created a sanctuary for illegals. But ladies and gentlemen, Carranza is an American product. In fact, he grew up in the United States, not in Peru. And he's probably a better representation of something that can now happen in many of our communities and that is the fate of children who grow up without documentation, but who came here as infants or as very young children and who now face barred <coughs> and very limited opportunities. What uh, research tells us is that those children turn to crime. So it's not the first generation, it is in the second generation that the faith of a community is really resolved. At present, we see a little bit of a convergence with the African-American experience. And that is, if we continue deporting and dividing, deporting individuals who are basically workers, if we continue uh, terrifying them, if we continue dividing their families, if we continue impeding the social mobility of children who have grown up in this country, 
the result will be a self-fulfilling prophecy, and that will be the creation of a new un underclass. I finish with a vignette of Sharon Nyanteki. I met Sharon uh, earlier this year uh, when she was part of a panel, and she was particularly impressive because she was a lot less angry than I am, and has a very poised, uh, extremely beautiful, fascinating teeth. It turns out that Sharon and Teki came to this country uh, uh, by the hand of her grandmother from Kenya, and the grandmother actually used a visa of a cousin in order to bring Sharon in. And Sharon grew up in the United States, definitely in America. Uh, she only found out that there might be a little bit of a problem with her situation in this country when she applied for a driver's license. But that was resolved and eventually she ended up a student at Rutgers University. She majored in political science and she graduated with honors. And then last year, 2006, she was married. And as part of this whole process, she made yet another attempt at adjusting her status so that she went to one of the offices of Homeland Security seeking for assistance. And right there and then, she was uh, apprehended, she was handcuffed, she was shackled. Now, she had the presence of mind that I would not have had to say, if you are going to arrest me, then you must read me my Miranda rights. And she was told, no, we don't have to read you your Miranda rights because you don't have Miranda rights. We are merely detaining you. In other words, now we have a large number of people who are not even entitled to a proper arrest of a criminal citizen because lack of lack of documentation. Sharon is not alone. Sharon represents two to three million children who have grown up in the United States and who are nonetheless technically deportable. She is one of about 27,000 people any given day who are detained in what is now known by some American journalists as the new American Gulag. And all these are people whose major infraction has been to cross the American, uh, the US-Mexico border seeking for the jobs that we uh, uh, need them uh, to perform. Is this the kind of country that we want? In the name of national security, we are actually ensuring that many children, like Sharon, who to this day cannot, is in completely unemployable because she doesn't have a social security number. What needs to be done? Deportations clearly are not the answer, but an adjustment of the realities of migration with what has been the tradition of fair play and justice in this country, that's what I ask all of you uh, to support in the days to come. Uh, it is very frustrating to observe on a daily basis the assault of misinformation on the radio and through politicians eager to play on the fears and the prejudices of the American public. I do know that this cannot stand. I'm sorry about the suffering endured by many people, unnecessary uh, suffering. I do trust that within a year, I hope, much of this will change and that we will have reconciled and adjusted our immigration policies to the conditions of immigration that exist on the ground. Thank you very much. I want to thank my home institution, Wake Forest University, and, and David Coates and Peter Ciavales for organizing this conference. Um, when historian May Nye published her recent book about the historical origins of the illegal alien in American law and society, she chose the title Impossible Subjects. And indeed, the topic of immigration to the United States, both legal and illegal, sometimes seemed impossible to discuss. Emotions run high and misconceptions abound, and the legal framework is impossibly complex. I am a legal scholar, and much of my work focuses on immigration enforcement, and in particular, deportation and detention policy. I also teach a basic course on immigration law. 
And one thing that strikes me as I carry on discussions of this impossible subject in a number of different forms is how <coughs> astonished people are when they encounter some of the intricacies of the immigration law and learn what the statute actually says and how it's carried out. So this happens in my class on a daily basis, starting when we work problems on admission. I'll call on a student to explain whether person X qualifies to immigrate to the United States, and the student will say rather timidly, Professor Taylor, I must not be reading this right, and I'm just not sure I understand because under the law, it seems the person qualifies for a green card, but they have to wait two years or four years or 12 years. That can't be right. And I reassure the student that she is reading the statute correctly, and then I see the same astonished faces again and again as we move through the semester. And over time, my students learn not to expect that the immigration law will make sense. <laughs> I also get astonished looks whenever I interact with lawyers and policymakers from other fields, whether I'm explaining detention policy to criminal defense lawyers, or I'm talking about deportation to US Court of Appeals judges whose dockets are now swamped with immigration cases. And eventually someone will say something to me along the lines of, you've got to be kidding. Um, Court of Appeals judges write opinions that call immigration law Kafkaesque, and they regularly criticize Congress and the Department of Homeland Security and the Department of Justice over the current state of the law. So I'm used to people becoming astonished or even outraged when they learn about immigration law. What astonishes me about the debate is that there is so little discussion of what the immigration statute actually says when we talk about immigration reform. Um, the usual refrain is this, we should enforce the laws presently on the books first and only then consider broader reform. Senator Dole made this statement and it is a key refrain among members of Congress opposed to comprehensive immigration reform. The reality, and my thesis, is that the laws presently on the books are broken and we must reform them as the first step to a sensible, workable, immigration policy. Now, I could illustrate this thesis that the laws are badly broken with any part of the Immigration and Nationality Act, and I'm gonna focus on three areas. First, the legal framework for admission. Some of our panelists have mentioned the history of immigration to the United States, and I wanna look briefly at the underlying laws. Second, the term illegal alien. In the halls of Congress, in the press, in our own discussions over immigration reform, we use this term as if it had a clearly defined meaning, and it doesn't. In reality, there are shades of legality and illegality, and inside the United States, it can be quite difficult to ascertain whether someone's presence is authorized. Third, I will talk about an even scarier term, criminal alien. The laws governing criminal deportation illustrate the risks of political overreaction to a problem and the need to set priorities and to retain discretion in enforcing immigration law. With each item that I've mentioned, I'll start with a myth, some widely misunderstood, uh, shared misunderstanding of the law, and then try to explain briefly what the reality is. Myth number one, and we've heard some discussion of this before, is that the way is clear for those who play by the rules to come to the United States just as my ancestors did. To examine this myth, we need to consider what rules governed historically and what rules govern now. The question of who gains lawful admission to the United States is actually resolved by the interplay of three factors. You have the substantive criteria for admission, the question of what you have to show to qualify. Do we take all comers or do we only take people in certain categories? We also have exclusion grounds. You can qualify for a visa and still be excludable and we have numerical limits. There's an overall ceiling of sorts for permanent residents. We also have per country limits for permanent residents. And there are also numerical limits within niche of many of the particular substantive categories. The federal government didn't actually regulate immigration at all until the late 1800s. And when Congress did get into the act, immigration law was about race-based exclusion and discriminatory national origin quotas. The Chinese Exclusion Act was one of our first immigration statutes passed in 1882, and Congress later extended that exclusion to, in, to bar entry from any, for any persons from Asia. We had numerical quotas for Europe that were enacted in 1921, and then they were rolled back drastically in 1924 to reduce immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe. 
And the intent of these laws, as many speakers has mentioned, have mentioned, is to preserve the racial and ethnic status quo of the United States. The race-based exclusions were not repealed completely until 1952, and we retained national origin quotas in some form until 1965. The, na the national origin quotas were repealed, actually, when they became linked to the debate over civil rights in this country. They were replaced by what we call now uniform per country limits. And the calculations are quite complicated, but our starting point is that no country can send more than 25,000 immigrants. That's the word we use in the law for lawful permanent residents to the United States each year. Now, obviously, everybody doesn't send 25,000. Some countries don't have any applicants. I just checked the data, and Liechtenstein didn't send any, any immigrants to the United States in 2006, and Madagascar sent 33, um, but they all have the same per country limit um, as countries that have a long-standing history of sending a large number of immigrants to the United States. Now, until 1976, we retained special dispensation for our neighbors. Mexico and other countries in the Western Hemisphere were not subject to the same per, per country limits until 1976. Uh, the history of immigration from Mexico is full of ebbs and flows, as other panelists have discussed. Sometimes Mexican labor was welcome, sometimes it was not. Um, when it was not welcome, for example, in the 1930s, um, the public charge exclusion ground was used to limit, it, to limit permanent migration from Mexico. That ground actually still operates in our statute. If a consular officer overseas or a border inspector considers that someone who is seeking entry is likely to become a public charge, that person can be excluded. And administrative requirements, the requirement that you get a visa and that you pay fees also operated through history to limit permanent migration to Mexico. Some people have described our historical admission system with the phrase, once you landed, you were legal. And this actually captures the notion that there were no substantive categories. There were no particular admission criteria that you had to meet to qualify for a permanent resident um, until the last half of the 20th century. It's actually a little bit more complex than that statement because of the operation of the exclusion grounds and the national origin quotas. But it is true that once the United States adopted a requirement that you secure a visa abroad, which operates to enforce these numerical limits before people land in the United States. Once we started using that visa system, very few Europeans who landed in Ellis Island, um, really about 1% were turned away. So what about admission criteria now? Under the current law, the substantive categories are a key limit. To become a permanent resident, the main categories are either family-sponsored or employment-based. You also still must not be inadmissible, and that's the inelegant word that the law now uses for exclusion, and you have to wait for the visa that you qualify for bec to become available. And I'll give you some examples in a moment, but for many immigrant categories, that means years, and for some temporary worker categories, that effectively means never. People often ask about numbers, um, so we'll take a quick glance at the number of people who are lawfully admitted to the United States. In fiscal year 2006, 1.2 million immigrants secured legal permanent resident status. 40% were immediate relatives of U.S. citizens. That's spouses, children, and minor children, and parents. Um, it's important to note that only adult citizens over age 21 can petition for their parents to immigrate. Now, immediate relatives of U.S. citizens is the one immigrant category not subject to any numerical or per country limits. This is the one area where we still take all comers. Um, in fiscal year 2006, there were 175.1 million total non-immigrant admissions for stays of limited duration. Now, this figure is a total number of admissions, not total individuals. Someone with a valid visa for a temporary stay may travel in and out of the United States a number of times, and in this figure, each entry counts as a separate admission. About 80% of those admissions were border crossings. 33.7 um, million non-immigrant admissions were from countries other than Canada and Mexico, and of those, 30 million were tourists or temporary visitors for business. 
Now, there are a number of the parts of the system that are broken, and I'm going to mention just a couple. Um, when we look at the categories of who is entitled to immigrate, some critics say we're too generous to family members. I want to focus briefly on the employment categories. In most of the employment-based categories, permission to immigrate to become a lawful permanent resident is job-specific. The employer must do a labor market test called labor certification to certify that there are not sufficient domestic workers available, willing, and qualified for the position, and that employment of the alien will not adversely affect the wages and working conditions of workers in the United States. This process is costly and very bureaucratic. It's also essentially built around a false assumption that the U.S. employer is recruiting a worker from overseas. The reality is very different. Most of the time, the foreign worker is already holding the job, usually with a temporary work visa. To gain employment certification, the employer is required to advertise this job and to recruit domestic workers to fill this particular job. Once a foreign worker becomes a lawful permanent resident, however, he becomes a permanent part of our domestic labor pool and can change jobs freely. So any protection of the domestic labor market that happens through labor certification is probably illusory. Anyone who has studied labor certification agrees that the system is badly broken. It doesn't serve the needs of U.S. employers, of domestic workers, of foreign workers, or our national interest. We also have problems with the substantive criteria for temporary work visas. And I don't have time to offer a detailed critique, but it's definitely fair to say that the categories in the statute for temporary visas for business don't fit the modern global economy. Uh, another part of the broken system comes from the numerical limits. There's a mismatch between what the law says and whether people can actually immigrate in any reasonable period of time. Um, in yesterday's panel, Mati Sal so showed some people who were here the visa chart that my students have to learn how to decipher. I'll give you the answers to some of the problems that they work. Um, the law says that a U.S. citizen can petition for an unmarried adult child to immigrate. The reality is that the backlog of pending applications means you wait six years for a visa to become available. But if the beneficiary is from Mexico, the wait is 15 years. The law says that lawful permanent residents who marry can bring their spouse to the United States. The reality is that the backlog of pending applications means you wait five years to be united with your spouse in this country. These delays are problematic for a number of reasons. The law does not serve its stated purpose of united family, uniting families, and the backlogs create incentives to violate the law. Even people who are entitled to immigrate come here illegally or overstay a temporary visa because they don't want to endure the family separation. The numerical limits also operate in some temporary worker categories where the demand far exceeds supply. And here I'll give a quick example. The H-1B category for professional and skilled workers has a cap of 65,000. April 2nd of this year was the first day that employers could file for fiscal year 2008. On April 2nd and 3rd, over 133,000 applications were received. The category was filled by lottery from applications filed these first two days, and there are no more visas available for fiscal year 2008. As one of my immigration attorney friends said to me, try explaining that to your client's human resources manager who simply cannot understand it when you tell her that her prospective employee, perhaps a foreign student who graduated from a U.S. college, qualifies for an H-1 visa but can't get one because all the available visas were snatched up on the first day. So to recap the myth and reality of the law governing admissions, for those who were not excluded by racial restrictions or national origin quotas, immigration was far more open for much of our history than it is today. Now, we can debate the appropriate direction of reform, more visas, fewer visas, and you'll hear some of that debate in the next panel, but it is impossible to defend the laws on the books as creating a workable system. The second myth I'll examine is that it's easy to determine who is illegal under the immigration statute. This picture is from the website of Sheriff Rich Richard Jones of Butler County, Ohio. Um, 
The word illegal alien dominates any discussion of immigration reform, and our use of this ter term assumes that it has a fixed defined meaning and that one size fits all. Once you determine someone is illegal, there's nothing further to debate. Neither assumption is true. The word illegal is a colloquial term. We use it in our daily language, but it is not defined anywhere in the immigration statute. And the word doesn't have a precise meaning because there are any number of ways that an individual's presence can be unauthorized, and in some cases there are routes to gain or restore lawful status. Also, many people assume the word illegal means a criminal violation, and actually some immigration violations can be prosecuted in criminal courts. It's unauthorized presence in the United States that's not a crime. And removal hearings are civil administrative proceedings. Now, when someone's apprehended at the border, it's usually easy to detect unauthorized status. And we have a number of routes for a quick return. We have procedures for withdrawing an application to enter. We have procedures called voluntary departure. And we have something called expedited removal, removal without a hearing, which now operates when someone is apprehended within 100 miles of the border. Inside the United States, it can be difficult to determine whether someone is in authorized status. First, there's the problem of technical violations. It's very easy for someone who is trying to comply by the law and to play by the rules to fall out of status. The examples are really too many to mention, um, but one is those temporary workers on professional visas, the H-1Bs we mentioned earlier, when they lose their job. The law does not provide for any grace period, any time to find a new job. Your status ends when your job ends. And when the dot-com boom ended, thousands of people became illegal overnight. It's also very easy to violate the law without knowing it. One example that comes to mind are foreign journalists who come to the U.S. to report a story. Many countries in Europe are visa waiver countries. You can board the plane with your passport and come to the United States for a short stay without a visa. But you're not supposed to do that if you're a journalist because there's a special non-immigrant visa category for foreign press. And occasionally, journalists get ensnared in this violation and they are swept from the airport inspection line to a jail cell. They're locked up in detention, often with criminal offenders, and then deported because even though they did have the right to enter, they didn't go about it in exactly the right way. There's also the problem of bureaucratic bungling. And here the stories are legion. You can fall out of status because of processing delays, which are actually different from the backlogs that I described earlier. Processing delays are the times that it takes a relevant agency to decide your case when a benefit is available, and you can have months or even years of waiting. You can fall out of status because you sent in a change of address form and it was never processed, or because you never received notice of your hearing or of your appointment. Suffice it to say that immigration agencies are notorious for incompetence and delays. There's also the reality of twilight status. And this is not a term in the law. It was coined by my colleague David Martin at the University of Virginia. He estimates that about 1.5 million people we might count as illegal have current or incipient claims to legal status in the United States. The largest category are those who are at some stage of the application process for permanent residency based on family ties, who are stuck in the backlogs or in the processing delays. And it's also true that some individuals who are not in authorized status have very strong equities to remain. Um, occasionally, the law recognizes these equities. We have a procedure called cancellation of removal for people who are not in authorized status, have been here for 10 years, are of good moral character. They can ask an immigration judge to cancel their removal if, and here's the big if, it would result in exceptional and extremely unusual hardship to a spouse, parent, or child who is a U.S. citizen or lawful permanent resident. This is an extremely difficult standard to meet, and the hardship that often results from deportation, that hardship alone doesn't count. In many cases, the equities are not recognized in the law. Many people live in what we call mixed status families. You have U.S. citizen children and undocumented parents who at present have no route to legal status. 
Others were smuggled into the United States as children and have lived here all of their lives, but at present have no route to legal status. So the point is that illegal is not a one-size-fits-all label. And to sort out all of these questions of status, you have to have a hearing. Um, most aliens apprehended inside the United States are entitled to a deportation hearing. And this reality is ignored in all of the talk over whether it's feasible to deport some 12 million people who are not in authorized status living in the US. We know we don't have enough detention capacity. The current capacity is about 27,500 beds and over half of that is rented space, space that we rent from state and local jails. Even assuming we had the beds, we don't have the money. Immigration and Customs Enforcement recently estimated that if we had mythical beds and we filled them all, it would cost $94 billion to detain and remove all persons not in authorized status. And that figure doesn't include court costs. And our immigration courts are already in crisis. The nation's immigration judges, there are just over 200 of them, completed 365,800 cases last fiscal year. At the same time, they received 350,000 new cases. Last year, the New York Times examined the docket of the immigration court in New York City. They found that immigration judges schedule 30 to 70 cases at a time for master calendar hearings. They hold four contested hearings a day, decide more than 15 cases a week, they don't have law clerks. They dictate oral decisions into tape recorders, which don't always work. Appeals of immigration judge decisions to the Board of Immigration Appeals are largely pro forma. They seldom get serious consideration, which has in turn created a flood of cases to the federal courts of appeals. Much of my work now focuses on the many ways that our immigration courts are broken. And the reality is that you can't put a price tag on the court cost to deport everyone who is deportable. Even if a significant number waived their hearing rights, which is what the government would like to see happen, it is still inconceivable that the system could adjudicate this many cases. Now, if there's anyone more unpopular than the illegal alien, it's the criminal alien. And I'm going to be brave and wade into this area because it's another area where the law is broken. The assumption is that even if we can't deport all the illegals, all criminal aliens should be deported. If an alien is not in authorized status, the conviction for a crime just provides an additional reason to deport somebody who is already deportable. Um, the difficult questions arise for lawful permanent residents who are entitled to remain in the United States indefinitely. The people that my colleague Hiroshi Motomura calls Americans in waiting. What crimes should render them deportable? There are three key provisions in the statute. There's something called crimes involving moral turpitude, which is defined by the case law. You can be deported for any controlled substance violation. And you can be deported if you have been convicted of an aggravated felony, as defined in the immigration statute. And I want to focus on what Congress has done with that aggravated felony definition. The list of aggravated felony offenses used to be a list of serious crimes. That's what you would think. Murder, drug trafficking, trafficking in firearms. Congress was eager to expand this list from the very beginning, but until about 10 years ago, an aggravated felony conviction required a felony conviction, and it generally required something on the order of a five-year prison term. Now you don't have to have even a felony conviction for a crime to be considered an aggravated felony under the immigration statute and render a lawful permanent resident deportable. I've listed three examples that actually come from real cases and illustrate common fact patterns. The statute says that sexual abuse of a minor is an aggravated felony under the immigration statute. And certainly that term does include serious offenses where we would want to see the offenders who are non-citizens deported. That term also includes statutory rape convictions, which happen when the state criminalizes sex between teenagers. So after the statute was amended, a lawful permanent resident in his 40s who pled guilty when he was 19 years old to the misdemeanor offense of having sex with his 15-year-old girlfriend and didn't serve a day in jail is now deportable for that offense. The second example is a jilted girlfriend who gets into a fight with her rival and pleads guilty to assault. 
a state court judge might impose a suspended sentence in this sort of situation. It's an indication that the crime is not all that serious and the person doesn't spend a day in jail. But if the sentence was a year or more, no matter that it was suspended, this conviction is an aggravated felony and it results in automatic deportation. The same is true of shoplifting and petty theft. If a suspended sentence of a year or more is imposed, it's an aggravated felony conviction. There is no statute of limitations to restrict how far back we go to find these, uh, these convictions and the amendments are retroactive. So in the examples that I gave, long-term residents can now be deported for long ago offenses that carried no immigration consequences at the time of the conviction. This zero tolerance stance for alien criminal offenders is politically popular, but it's very costly. The statute requires mandatory detention. So even if we know that our shoplifter is not dangerous and does not pose a risk of flight, she must be detained with no possibility of re release for the time that it takes to resolve the deportation case. If it is an aggravated felony offense, deportation is automatic. There is no possibility to weigh the equities of the case. It doesn't matter how long this person has been in the United States. In the assault example that I gave you, the woman was adopted as an infant by a US citizen couple who didn't know that they had to naturalize their daughter for her to become a citizen. We don't consider how long ago the conviction was, we don't consider how serious the offense was, and we don't consider whether this person has family ties in the United States. And this law is not only exceedingly harsh, it's also exceedingly complex. The Supreme Court has decided seven cases on the detention and deportation of criminal offenders since 2001. This issue is such a hot potato. It's so easy to demonize criminal aliens that there's no real prospect. I don't think that the criminal deportation grounds will be part of any reform package unless it's to make the laws harsher. But I think we have to consider that the statutes as now written do not serve any legitimate purpose. We have strayed too far from the rationale that we're protecting the public when we deport long-term residents for long ago minor crimes. We might say that we're trying to punish them, but punishment happens in the criminal process and aliens serve out their criminal sentence before deportation. For a century, the Supreme Court has said that deportation is not punishment. We might say that they violated the terms of admission by committing a crime, but fairness dictates that we not change the rules in the middle of the game. And we waste scarce detention space and scarce enforcement resources when everyone with a criminal conviction who falls into these statutory definitions is, snare, is ensnared in automatic deportation. So to recap the myths and reality of immigration law, in the admission context, we romanticize our history and we fail to understand how current law thwarts even those who play by the rules. The label illegal alien masks complexities of the immigration status. And criminal deportation is too politically explosive to be on the table for reform, but it's also costly to enforce the law without sensible priorities and without discretion. So what broader lessons can we draw from our brief foray into immigration law? Um, the first essentially restates the reason for having this conference. We can't let myth and rhetoric substitute for serious analysis. We shouldn't use labels like illegal alien or criminal alien to foreclose debate. Second, we need to identify what is broken. Close attention to the current law is curiously absent from the debate. And we need to fix what is broken rather than stick with the laws on the books when they are not working. The reality is that it just doesn't make sense to keep hammering away at this problem without reforming the law when reform is the only route to credible immigration enforcement and to a sensible workable policy. And finally, what is politically acceptable these days may be completely unworkable. I'm not sure what would have happened if immigration reform had passed this year because some aspects of the compromise proposal, particularly the touchback provision for legalization, were probably impossible to implement. We have to remember that the law has to be carried out in the real world by immigration agencies that range from the overtaxed to the completely dysfunctional. So my final plea, and a plea which will certainly fall on deaf ears in Congress, is don't make this impossibly complicated statute even more complex. Thank you, Mary.